this experience. We are halfway through. She's going to start. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Megan is in control of the recording. So, thank you, Megan, for being all things technology. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I just have to look over here and make sure that it's all good. If she comes to the door and does cut, then we'll just rewind and start over. But I think we're good for now. Um, so again, thank you all uh, for being here. I'm excited to be with you again this morning and even more excited because my daughter is hanging out with us today all the way from Miami. So that's always fun for me when she's hanging out. Um, so like I said, we, we're at the halfway mark. Uh, session five, uh, we have moved through, but we only get to do two verses today. Uh, I haven't been with you, but I've been watching online. So at each time Mark says it, we only do two verses and then, you know, we, we splurged and got a couple extra verses and we're going back to two verses now. Um, and so just again, as a quick review, uh, we've talked about through this whole, this, this half of the study, um, we've learned in week one that God brings us to the right place at the right time in his own way, in his own time, for his glory, for our good. We talked about, we know that when that happens, though, that God is going to show up for us, but there are times when Satan shows up as well, because as I always say, he, he has to do his job. And then on last week, uh, as Diane mentioned in her prayer, Mark talked about the fact that prayer matters. And we talked, we learned that we have to pray earnestly, but we also have to pray expectantly. And so this week, as we keep moving along in our study, we're going to talk about the virtue of patience. And I think it was week two, maybe, that someone had made a comment or a question about patience week two or week three, I believe it was. So we're going to talk about the virtue of patience and what we do as we're still moving through this Exodus experience and we become afraid. So I want to share just a quick illustration with you uh, before we get started. We're going to look at still in Exodus 14. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14 today. But a quick illustration for you. Uh, there was a speedboat driver who had survived a racing accident, and he described what happened in that accident. And here's what he said. He said he had been at near top speeds. Um, when his boat somehow veered slightly off track and it hit a wave at a really dangerous angle. And any of you that, that do boating or jet skis, you know, when you're, when you're plugging along, it, it feels real good and it's a whole lot of fun. But if you hit that wave the exact wrong way, you may go one way and the jet ski or boat goes the other. And so he said the combined force of his speed and the size and the angle of the wave sent the boat spinning crazily in the air. Oh, he was thrown from his seat and propelled deeply into the water. Oh. So deep, in fact, that he had no idea which direction was the surface. He had to remain calm mm -hmm. and wait for the buoyancy of his life vest to begin pulling him up. Wow. Once he discovered which way was up, he began to swim for the surface. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we find ourselves in situations and we're surrounded by our Exodus experience, whatever that is, where we are so deeply immersed in it that we literally don't know which way is up. But when that happens, we too have to remain calm, waiting for God's gentle tug to pull us back to the surface and in the right direction. And so our life vest during those times <coughs> may be other Christians, it may be the scriptures, or the leading of the Holy Spirit. But the key for us is to be dependent upon him and have the patience to trust him to work in his own time and in his own way. So that's what we're going to look at today. Exodus chapter 14 verses 13 and 14 because what we find is that when we wait on God when we wait on him and he's going to show up but we have to pay attention so that we can discover and we can see his attributes on display because that lets us know that he's showing up we're going to talk about those attributes there's six of them that we're going to move through today he casts out fear he calls us to trust he comforts us in distress 
He clears away danger, he confronts evil, and he creates peace. So that's what we're going to dig into today. So Exodus 14, verses 13 through 14 again, just only two verses today, but they are chocked full of, uh, of knowledge and wisdom for us. And so it says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And so when we think about what's happening here, we've talked about where we are in the scriptures. The Israelites have made their way. God has delivered them. They're, they're running. They've left uh, Pharaoh's hold, if you will. They've made their way out. But all of a sudden now Pharaoh has realized, wait a minute, I... I, really, I did let them go. I, didn't, I don't think I meant to do that. And so now he is on their trail, and they have now become afraid again. And this, when we think about what Moses is saying to them during this time, this is probably one of, his, one of the best speeches that he gives, and probably his finest hour, because what he's urging them to do is to be calm to command, and gives them a command that is simple. He says, be patient and waiting in the midst of the chaos and fear. So Moses knew God. Moses had experience with God. They all did. But Moses, remember, he is their leader. And so he has, he is, has experience with God. He trusts God. And even though the people have seen God work in their lives miraculously throughout this experience, he's worked fantastically. He's done amazing things for them. But yet, they were still full of fear and doubt. And can any of us identify that even when God has shown himself dramatically in our lives, another situation shows up, another excess experience, we find ourselves there and we find ourselves full of fear and doubt. So we're going to talk about the attributes that we need to look for that will help us remain patient. The first one is he casts out fear. The scripture says, do not be afraid. So what we find is that fear not, and this phrase, this phrase, fear not and do not be afraid. There are 107 references in the Old Testament and 42 in the New Testament. And so I remember Mark said last week, when repetition, when you keep hearing it over and over again, that means it's important. And so God is saying, fear not, do not be afraid. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, verses 29 through 31, it says, Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Deuteronomy 3, verse 22, he says this, You must not fear them, for the Lord your God himself fights for you. Deuteronomy 31 and 6, he keeps repeating it. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For who? The Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. Over and over, there's this theme of do not be afraid. But not only do not be afraid, but why? Because the Lord, your God, he's the one that's with you. He's the one that's fighting for you in the midst of this Exodus experience that you find yourself. Because remember, he's the one that brought you to it. The right time, the right place for his glory, for your good. That's what we have to keep in mind. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 47 then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Romans 8, I love this, probably one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture in the Bible. Romans 8 verses 31 through 37. What then shall we say to these things? And this is after, of course, we go through and we know that all things work together. We get to verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Like we could stop right there. 
If God is for us, the God of the universe, who has shown himself to be so powerful in our lives, and if we only look at what he did in the Old Testament with the children of Israel, but then when we look at our own individual lives, we could literally stop right there. If God is for us, who can be against us? But Paul keeps going. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. He's not still dead. That's where the power is. He says, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he goes on this, this rant that I love. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Does that sound like an Exodus experience in any of that? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, I love a yet and a but in scripture. <laughs> yet, in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. This is the God who casts out fear. So when he says, do not be afraid, fear not, we can hold on to that because this is the God we're talking about. He's the one that has the power to make us more than conquerors through him because he loves us that much. John Hanna says this, he says, as he's talking about uh, the children of Israel, he says, as they came to their greatest moment of deliverance, listen to this, the people of God were full of distrust and fear. Mm -hmm. As they got to their greatest moment of deliverance, they had been held captive for 430 years and God's like, okay, enough, I'm bringing you out of this thing. But when Pharaoh shows up, and Mark talked about it last week, the number of, of Pharaoh's army that was after them couldn't be compared to the number of the children of Israel. We're talking 2 million people and about 600 of Pharaoh's folk. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> the odds are in our favor. <laughs> but he says, as they came to their greatest moment of deliverance, the people of God were full of distrust and fear. Does that sound like us? Unfortunately, yes. So who is it that goes before us? Huh. It's God. Who is it that brought us again to the right place at the right time? And who is it that we have to look to to show up for us? And he's going to show up in his way for his glory, but for our good. Okay. So then what do we do? We pray. And we wait. And that's the part we don't like, the waiting part. The prayer part we, we're cool with, it's the waiting part. Because we want to pray and then like as soon as we say amen, we want to open our eyes and be like, okay, there's the answer. And that's not how it works. So he also, not only does he cast out fear, but he calls us to trust him. The scripture says, stand still. In other words, to wait upon the Lord. I don't know about you all, but I have less of a problem now waiting than I did previously, but I still have a problem waiting. <laughs> I tend to want it yesterday. And that is not how it works with God. Robert J. Morgan says this. He says, this is what the biblical phrase, wait on the Lord is about. Committing our Exodus experiences to him in prayer, trusting him and waiting for him to work. Doing that runs counter to our proactive, assertive selves. We want to do something to speed up the process. We want to fix it because clearly God doesn't know what he's doing with this one. Clearly, he just he's not paying attention, so let me help him out a little bit. But he goes on to say, but many a modern migraine would be cured by a good dose of Psalm 37, verse 7 through 8. And it says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Mm -hmm. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. 
And the reason we can rest is because he is the God who says, I've got you. He's the God who has all the power to handle whatever the excess experiences you find yourself moving through. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Matthew Henry goes on to say, he says, in times of great difficulty and great expectation, it is our wisdom to keep our spirits calm, quiet, and sedate. For then we are in the best frame both to do our own work and to consider the work of God. You hear how both of them, they're, they're, it's so counterintuitive to what we want to do right. when we're in the excess experience. We get ourselves all riled up and worked up and we fret it because we're trying to fix it. But what God is saying and what these wonderful writers are saying is the exact opposite. It's when you rest in him that you're actually going to be able to wait because there's that's where the peace is going to come in, okay? So when we talk about this, this standing still, this waiting on the Lord, what does that look like? What, what does that tangibly look like? How do you grab hold to that? And so John Artberg says this. He says, waiting on the Lord is a confident, disciplined, expectant, active, sometimes painful mm -hmm. clinging to God. That part. <laughs> he says, waiting on the Lord is the continual daily decision to say, God, I will trust you and I will obey you, even though the circumstances of my life are not turning out the way I want them to. And they may never turn out the way I want them to. I'm betting everything on you and there is no plan B, God. I'm betting everything on you, God. And we think about where he says here, um, and they may never turn out the way I want them to. I think when we talked about in, in Strong at the Broken Places, we were moving through that study, and we talked about um, suffering. And we talked about sometimes there is no answer. There's, there's no answer to the why. And so as I, I studied this and I read over this, that hit me because they may, there may, it may not ever turn out the way I want it to. But will I still trust him? Will I still hold on to him believing that he has my best interest at heart? So there's a, there was an economist who <laughs> had a question for God. He, he asked God, he said, Lord, is it true that a thousand years for us is just like one minute to you? And so the Lord said, yes. So the economist says, well, then a million dollars to us must be like a pit, one penny to you. And so the Lord said, well, yes, it is. <laughs> so then this economist, because, you know, he knows all things finances, he says, well, Lord, will you give me one of those pennies? <laughs> and the Lord said, all right, I will. Wait here a minute. <laughs> wait here a minute again it, it, we have to learn to wait and recognize that it is God who is working and moving us through our excess experience because he's the one who brought us to it Isaiah 40 and 31 says this but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you ever paid attention to, but those who wait on the Lord, those are the ones who are going to have their strength renewed. So, so it's in the waiting where our strength is actually renewed. Again, so counterintuitive to the way we operate and what we think. But it's in the waiting on him knowing and believing that he is going to respond to us. So, who am I called to trust in? God. What does waiting on the Lord look like to us individually? This is a question that each one of us has to answer. Is it easy? No. Do, do I struggle with it from time to time? Yes. Yeah. So, what do we have to do? We pray, we wait, and we trust. God also, he comforts us in our distress. It says, see the salvation of the Lord. So in this context, that word salvation there in the Hebrew 
it refers to salvation from danger or trouble, especially from enemies. And that's exactly what's happening with the children of Israel now. Without a doubt, Pharaoh is an enemy, and they need salvation from him because he has no good intentions for them, okay? He wants to chase them down and kill them and or bring them back into slavery, okay? So to see the salvation of the Lord, so that's what salvation means in this context. And so the Israelites are, another idea here is that in the Hebrew that this, this word salvation in this particular context is the root word that has the idea of space or room. Okay, so the Israelites, think about it now, they are squeezed on all sides and God's salvation from Pharaoh, the enemy, okay, is going to give them room to breathe. That's what his salvation is going to do. So this is the irony of it all. In order for God to give them the space and the room to breathe, they have to leave room for him to do what only he can do. So again, they can't interject. We can't insert ourselves in the plan. We've got to give God the space or the room to do what only he can do. If we try to fill in that space with our plan, we mess it all up. Okay. And God then doesn't have the space or room to do his work. You see how this, it, it's so contrary to how we tend to operate. But if we could grasp that, we could find because it says scripture says when we wait on him that's where our strength is renewed um so again leaving room for god do do we leave room for him why do we do that because when we leave room for god that's when he gets to show himself off like it says in ephesians 3 and 20 now unto him who is able to do what exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That's when we get to see the exceedingly abundantly, when we wait and give him room to do what only he can do. Because there's some stuff, y'all, that, listen, if God don't show up, it is not happening. If he doesn't do it, it is not getting done. I had an experience like that myself back in, in, in the fall where it was a, God, if you don't do it, it, it ain't, it's, it's just not happening situation. And I had to learn to trust and wait on him and keep saying, all right, okay, all right, Lord. so you do realize if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. But I waited and I had to hold myself back from trying to interject. I had to hold myself back from the fretting and the worrying. And when I tell you God blew a door wide open that only he could do, there was no way that I could have done it. I had no idea. I literally walked into a room one day, had a conversation and God blew my mind. And all I could do was pace back and forth in the room in front of a friend of mine because I literally couldn't speak. Because God had done exceedingly abundantly because he had room. I didn't necessarily know at the time that I was giving him room. I just knew, God, if you don't do it, it is not going to get done. So you need to handle this. And he did. So God will, when we give him room to work and do his work, oh, y'all, some good stuff can happen particularly when we find ourselves in an excess experience. So that's what we have to hold on to. If we keep, if we go back to the very beginning, he has us there. So if he has us there, if we follow that line. If he's got me there, he's got me there for his, for in his, for his purpose, for, for his glory, for my purpose. He's going to bring that. There's a reason I'm there. If, as long as God's got his hand on me in it. Oh, come on now. Pharaoh can chase me all he wants to. The weapon may form, but it won't do what? It won't prosper. No. It, it may very well form, and Pharaoh may very well chase you, but God is going to open up a seed that's going to swallow him up because that's what he does if I give him room to do his work. All right? So a, another illustration when we look at this, this is really beautiful when I read this. Another illustration for verses 13 and 14 um, there's a modern version of verse 13 that kind of goes like this. It says, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. 
But it says that's not, in fact, the meaning, the meaning of it. What Moses was really saying was this. Listen to this, y'all. You should be glad you are seeing the Egyptian army coming at you. Wait a minute, what? Because you have, because you have seen the Egyptians, it means that God's prediction that he will trick them and trap them is about to be fulfilled. Ooh, if you didn't see them, now that would be cause for worry because God's prediction to us would not be coming true. So what Moses is saying is, look, the fact that y'all see them coming, you should really start a shouting party because that says <laughs> that God is about to do exactly what he said he was going to do. So don't don't be afraid. Don't worry. If you didn't see them, that would be cause to worry. But the fact that you do, oh, just get ready to have a party because God is about to do what he said he was going to do. His word is true. Amen. All right. Amen. So who brings salvation? God. God does. The question we have to ask is, do we give him room so that he can give us room to breathe? And do we give him room to do his work? Do, do we ultimately trust him with our Exodus experience? That's the question we have to ask. Do I really trust you, God, with this? So what do we do? We back up and we give him room to work. We pray, we wait, we trust, we stand still. God also clears away danger. It says he will accomplish. Who's going to accomplish it? God. Okay. What he had done prior, prior to this, he says he accomplished this, excuse me, he accomplished the children of Israel, he accomplished their release miraculously. Remember how he worked all of this out for them mm -hmm. to even get free from Pharaoh. He's the one, remember, who hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh's heart had already been hardened, and God was like, okay, so you got a heart, and let me, let me just raise it up a, a notch. So, though Moses, again, remember, he, he uses Moses. He also, remember, he'd also sent 10 plagues. He had also hardened Pharaoh's heart. He had answered their prayer. So he'd done all of this for them. He, God is the one who will accomplish the work, okay? For the Israelites, they had plenty of reasons to be afraid. And that's the thing. The, the fear, I mean, it, it was real. Pharaoh was coming. He had held them captive for 430 years, so they had reason to be afraid. But they forgot that they had the ally who is God on their side. They forgot all that he had already done. And how many times do we forget what God has already done? I call it spiritual amnesia. <laughs> we forget that the excess experience we're in right now, because reality is we're probably going to go through more than one. Yeah. We forget that this one isn't the first one. And the fact that we're in this one means that he's brought us through all of those back there. So if he's brought us through all of those back there, he can bring us through this one right here mm -hmm. and whichever ones are going to come after it. Okay. So... What has, what has God accomplished in your life? What, what Exodus experience has he already brought you through? So how can you look to that as proof that, okay, I'm in another one and I don't like it and it doesn't feel good and I am scared. But God, you brought me through though, through not just that one, but those. <laughs> and so that means I can trust you to bring me through this one. What, what has he accomplished in your life? Has it been salvation? Has, has he saved you from danger from an enemy? Is it a job, family, your health? <laughs> I haven't been with you all because it's been my health. He's, he's brought me through that. He's continuing to bring me through that Exodus experience. His grace, his mercy, all of that. And how do we, how do we then respond to what he's accomplished? We thank him. <laughs> so we pray, we wait, we trust, we stand still, and we thank him. God also confronts evil. Says the Lord will fight for you. So here, here, here's what he says. This is another translation. He says, get a grip on yourself and bring those emotions under control. Work your way from fear to faith and trust me for I will fight for you. 
That's what God is saying. This, this is God's domain. He is saying, and this is, this is one of the things I always said, that emotion isn't necessarily the issue because we're, we're created with those. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the issue that we, that we experience the fear. But as soon as it hits, what do we do with it? How do we respond? And that's what God is saying. Move from fear to faith. You got to trust me because I've already told you that I'm going to fight for you. He says, we, we saw, again, two weeks ago when we talked about Satan and the, how when God is working, Satan isn't asleep, unfortunately. He's still working as well. But we have to keep our eyes fixed on who? Jesus. On Jesus versus fixing our eyes on our circumstance. Because if we only look at the excess experience, if we only look at our circumstance, we will flat lose our minds. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, that is where our hope comes from. That is where our peace comes from. That is where our joy comes from. That is where what I call that, that Holy Ghost flat-footed fight comes from, where you can look at Satan and be like, okay, all, all right. You, you may swing, you may have one, but listen, I serve a God who has already told me he is fighting for you. And oh, by the way, you happen to already be defeated. Ooh, yeah. So, okay. And you happen to be defeated because of God's son, Jesus, who we sent to do what? Mm -hmm. save us. To save me. So, okay. Come on, Satan. You, you, you may rock me a little bit. I may stumble. Oh, but I'm not going to fall. And if I happen to fall, God's word says he's going to uphold me with what? His righteous right hand. So I'm getting back up. And you might want to move around when I get up. <laughs> okay. So he confronts evil. So when, when have I seen God fight for me? When, when have I seen him fight for me? What, what, is, what is that, and what has that done for me? So we pray, we wait, we trust, we stand still, we thank him, we focus on Christ. Then it says he creates peace. It says you shall hold your peace. Again, shalom. This is, this is also God's domain, this peace. God is the one who brings peace. When we are moving through our Exodus experience, there are so often times that we look to a lot of other things and people to bring us peace. God is the one who brings peace. He restores peace and he builds up our peace to make everything as it's supposed to be. God is the one who does that. And so the command is to hold our peace, which means I don't have to go find peace somewhere. It's a peace I already have. He's telling me to hold on to what I already have. Hold my peace. The peace that I have because of Jesus. The peace that I have because of the fruit of the spirit. That's one of the peace that I get in Christ. He says, hold on to what I already have in him. Hold on to it. Don't, don't allow the Exodus experience to take your peace, to steal it, to push it under a bushel, to throw it away, to cause you to fret and have headaches and worry. He says, hold on to it. And you hold on to it in him. So one of the things that's important for us to understand as we are looking at these att attributes of God is that, and this is, this is the cool part, the timing and the application of all of them, independent upon us, <laughs> is still all under God's control. He, he, he's still moving all of the pieces the way that he wants to, because again, it's all for his glory <laughs> and for our good. Okay? Um, C.H. McIntosh said this. He says, this is good, y'all. He says, faith raises the soul above the difficulty, straight to God himself, and enables one to stand still. We gain nothing from our restless and anxious efforts. It is therefore true wisdom in all times of difficulty and perplexity to stand still, to wait upon God, 
and he will assuredly open a way for us. Not maybe, not possibly, not he's going to think about it. He will assuredly open a way for us. But we have to stand still. I can't be running all the way over here. I can't be running over there. I've got to stand still and wait for him to open the way. Because if I'm way over there and he opens the way right here and I need to be standing still, I'm going to miss it. Stand still and wait for him to open the way. So have any of you heard of the century plant? Yes. 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 The century plant? Century, yes. Yeah, couple, okay. This is gonna be good. Okay. Because <laughs> I have listen. So it's it's a unique plant that thrives in difficult climates. You're gonna get your shot in a minute. Watch this. In difficult climates, rocky terrain, desert climates with little water. That's where it thrives. It has a dramatic splayed leaf that can grow to be up to a foot wide and can reach 12 feet in diameter. Yeah. But perhaps the most impressive thing about the century plant is that it has a long reproductive cycle, about 20 to 40 years. For that time period, the plant stands still, but produces no flower. Then one year, Without warning, a new bud sprouts. The bud, which resembles a tree trunk-sized asparagus spear, shoots into the sky at a fantastic rate of seven inches per day, reaching an eventual height of between 20 and 40 feet. Mm. Then it crowns itself with multiple clumps of yellowish, orangish, reddish blossoms that last up to three weeks. So like the century plant, Many of the most glorious things that happen to us come after a long wait. It's a long wait. <laughs> the reproductive cycle is 20 to 40 years. But when it finally blooms, only God can do that. Mm -hmm. So when we find ourselves in this excess experience, and they're typically not short bits of time, it's usually not a day, <laughs> right. usually not even a week. You might get a week every now and then, but it's, it's usually one that, and we gotta walk through for a minute and we gotta stand still and we gotta wait on him because at the end of the waiting, God is going to show up and there's going to be something glorious that happens for his glory, but for our good. And we can look back and be like, God, really? You, that's what that was about? Okay. That's okay. And that's when we praise him. That's when we honor him. That's when we serve him. That's when we give more. because we see what he's done in our lives. We see how much he loves us, that he, he's had us waiting in in this excess experience and we're like god what are you doing but I, okay i'm gonna stand here wait because you told me to but when he makes it all clear it's a glorious thing so when you've been in an excess experience have you have you found that peace have you known that peace have you held on to that peace that we already have because of jesus have you held on to it while you've been waiting. So we pray, we wait, we trust, we stand still, we thank him, we focus on Christ, and we hold on to our peace. Remember James chapter one, verse two through four? It says, my brethren do what? Count, count how much of a joy? All of it. <laughs> count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing what? That the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is what God wants to do in us. He wants to perfect that patience so he can perfect us. 
That's what he wants to do. Robert J. Morgan said this. He said, many times we cannot solve problems, heal hurts, change circumstances, or win our own battles. We must kneel in prayer, then stand to see what he will do. We must leave room for God, staying calm and giving him time to work. He is the one who casts out fear, who calls us to trust, who comforts in distress, he clears away danger, he confronts evil, and he creates peace. Patience becomes a virtue when we pray and wait on him to work for his glory and for our good. I want to share lyrics of this song. I was actually listening to it. I've been listening to it for several weeks, but I was listening to it actually on the way here. Um, it's a song by Johnson McReynolds. And he says, I've seen it for myself. He says, if you're thinking that my father isn't capable of healing, let me tell you, if you're thinking that he isn't strong enough to solve your problems, let me tell you. He says, I've seen it, I've lived it, I've witnessed that he will come through for you. He says, I've had some doubts myself, but the years have taught me well. There's no question that he's real and I don't need nobody else. Mm -hmm. He says, I've seen it, I've lived it, I've witnessed that he will come through. He says, he did it. It's finished, so trust him. Mm. I know he'll come through. It's all true. Mm. I've seen it. I've lived it. I've witnessed that he will come through for you. Yeah. In our excess experience, if we pray, we wait, we trust, we stand still, we thank him, we focus on Christ, and we hold on to our peace, we will be able to say, I've seen it, I've lived it, I've witnessed, he will come through. Questions, <laughs> comments? Well, I am constantly thinking of Psalms 23 mm. as we have mm -hmm. studied uh, <laughs> Exodus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, though I walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So our shepherd, thank God he did send mm -hmm. his son. Yes. To be our shepherd in this day, in his time, for our good. Exactly. Exactly. He's a good, good shepherd. A good, good father. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was thinking about how you said he confronts evil and during this season, how he confronts <coughs> evil at the cross. Oh. And then the resurrection. Yes. It, 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 that's not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. And that's the beauty of all of this. That's not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And that, so when we're moving through these, we find ourselves in these Exodus experiences. It's not the end of the story. Mm. We, we, the end has already been written. We, we just got to make our way through this, this great master play that God has put together. Mm -hmm. But we know how this thing ends. We just got to remember that. Don't get spiritual amnesia mm. and forget that we know the end. And the end is that he, Jesus has already won for us. Mm -hmm. We just... We just got to pray, wait, <laughs> trust, thank him. That's what Stand we have still. to do. Stand still while we're in it, knowing that is not the end of the story. <laughs> well, don't you think also nations, groups of people, and so forth have Exodus experience? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I personally believe mm -hmm. that the U.S. of A. is in a tremendous exodus. Listen, Miss Nail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother story for a different day. I would just say yes. Yeah. 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 May I just say something? Yes, ma'am. Really, you spoke to my heart um, about just that. 
about a week ago, my son was um, costed by a student. He's a teacher in a high school. And um, I've been, you know, of course I've prayed over it, but I've been fret, mm. fretting in my spirit because even though he's, he's seen to it that there are consequences for this young man, I fear. I fear because of what's going on, how many times this yeah. is going on in our nation. And um, when you said, praise God, that he showed him the trouble and who the trouble was, mm -hmm. because now... God is getting ready to work. It's strange you would say it like that because when he called to tell me, I told him not only was I praying for his safety, but I was also going to pray that while that young man was in alternative school, mm -hmm. God would touch his heart. Yeah. <laughs> because Scott told me, Mom, he just didn't have a dad that taught him right from wrong. And yeah. I worry about him. And he feels like that about all his students. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I, I'm going to really trust that prayer now because he is God. Yeah. And he wants the same thing for this young man. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be amazing to see him turn what appears to be an enemy into a child of God? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Pray yeah. earnestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And expect expectantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because prayer matters. Yeah, it does matter. But I, I want to thank you for bringing that up because he showed Israel the enemy. Yes. And they should have been going, yes, he's going to work now. Yeah. And that's how I should be doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that this kid is the enemy. We know the real enemy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. God has something good in the worst of situations. Yes, he does. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He does. And it's hard for us sometimes to, to see that, to believe that when we're in it. Mm -hmm. But that's actually what he wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And when we that's why I love this study so much, because if if we again, if we start at the beginning, he brought us to it. Mm -hmm. Whatever that worst is, he brought us to it. And if he did, it's for his glory, for our good, he's doing something in it. Yeah. We just have to hold on to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to check and see if we have any. Comments and hopefully I don't mess up the whole chat. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank, right. thank you all oh, online for yeah. your comments. Oh, yes, ma'am. I had another thought uh, when you, it just struck me with these, uh, the waiting, the various many times of blessing of seeing the enemy, like you said, he caused the Israelites to see the enemy, the actual enemy, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and yet also to open their eyes to see he's going to fight for you. And so sometimes in the waiting, I don't always know the enemy. I don't know what I'm fighting against. It can be my own emotions. Yeah. It's so embroiled in it. And yet in the seeing, in the waiting, and the praying, and the trusting, it gives us wisdom to yes. see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, he does. Thank you, Chris. We have a question online. Okay. It is, as we are not on the same level of maturity and understanding, patience is a big challenge for most people. Fear is a common response to uncertainties. Mm -hmm. How should we handle impatient people who are in a hurry to, or who are in a hurry for quick results? So mm -hmm. others who are in a, in a hurry. We remind them of this. <laughs> we remind them of God's of God's work, particularly if we're talking about other believers. We we I think this is an excellent spot to take them back to, and and show them that God has said to us. We just said a hundred and what I tell you, one hundred and forty forty two times in hundred hundred and seven times in the Old Testament, forty two in the New Testament, where God tells us, "Do not be afraid, fear not." So that's an excellent spot to start. He has given us, the, uh, and that's a command. It's not like he said, so, hey, you know. If you think about it. Yeah. Think about not worrying. No, he says, do not fear. Fear not. And, he's, and then every time he says that, he attaches himself to it. I'm telling you, do not fear, fear not. But here's why. Because I'm here, and I'm going to fight for you. So I think when we're trying to help others, 
who are who may be struggling and that's a great question because we are at different levels of, of spiritual maturity but this is how we can help to build one another up with god's word not what we think not what somebody else said but with god's word god said don't fear and here's why and then from there we can perhaps give a testimony of what here's what god did in my life and here's how i know this this to be true again i've seen it mm -hmm. i've lived it i've witnessed then we can bring in that testimony so prayerfully that that helps yes ma'am well i find that uh sometimes people want to fix it themselves yeah. and when you're talking to someone mm -hmm. who is impatient look at me Am I impatient with oh, this person? That's good. Maybe this person only wants to have someone listen. Mm -hmm. You cannot fix it. Turn it over to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. Yeah, we're we're real big on being fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know what else uh, that occurred to me is because I'm counseling somebody right now who's going through a really hard time. It's so important that we know, well, let me tell you what an Exodus 14, 13 through 14, rather than say, oh, I read this great book, you need to go there, because books aren't the answer. Mm. Books of the Bible are the answer because Amen. God authored it, and he's not going to let you down. He's not going to not be there for you when he says he will. Yeah. Absolutely. God's word is true. That's why it's important to be in his word and to try and remember where you saw it in the word. Absolutely. That's that's what holds us. Mm -hmm. That is what's hold that is what holds us to your point. That's what gives us what we need each and every day yeah. for our own situations. And as you said, we're counseling other people. It's God's word, what he said. And I've seen it. Yeah. I've lived it. Seen it. I've witnessed. Yeah. His word is true. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. God bless you. Let me. Was there anything else? Let me. Thank you so much, Megan. Let me pray for us. Mark will be back next week, um, as far as I know, uh, and I will probably be back next week as well, hanging out with you all. So, Good. Uh, let me pray for us. God, how we thank you. Uh, thank you for your word, God. God, we thank you even for the excess experiences that you take us through, because they allow us to see you. They allow us to. Uh, grow in our patience. They allow us to stand and they allow us to see your attributes. So we thank you, God, for this lesson. I pray for each one who is here in the building and I pray for those who've been listening online, God, that you would just touch and cover each and every one of them, whatever their individual situations may be, God, and trusting. Uh, and we pray earnestly and we pray expectantly, God, knowing that you will answer and that you will do so according to your will. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we thank you. And I'm sorry, I messed up. I did not introduce Catherine Barner to those of you who don't know her. She is an author. She is a speaker. She is a teacher. She has a radio show. I guess you still do. I She's, don't anymore. But. Okay, she doesn't have a radio show anymore because she probably didn't have time. But here's the deal. She, as you can see, is a wonderful teacher. So for if you've never heard her before until today, I'm so glad you got to hear her today. Thank you.